Hello, everyone. How you doing? I'm Jonas. Pleased to meet you. Well, those of you I don't know already. Hope everyone's feeling cozy this uh, nice afternoon. Um, I'm your next panel. <laughs> this is uh, this is the first time I've done. Uh, this isn't the first time I've Twitch streamed. I've, Twitch, I've been a Twitch streamer for about three years. This is the first time I've done anything quite like this. So it's going to be interesting. <laughs> So basically, um, what we'll be discussing today is um, helpful hardware and software for working on uh, digital comics, um, some useful tips and features in Clip Studio Paint, which is my program of choice for working on comics, uh, the actual process of the comic making. I'm not going to go get too deep into it because there is a lot. Rather, what I want to impart, hopefully, is some of the most useful, specific things, shortcuts, and uh, workarounds that I myself have discovered in this process, stuff that I think is maybe worth sharing. <laughs> and if we have time at the end, uh, we'll do a little Q&A. Um, now, important, dis <laughs> important disclaimer, this is going to be a bit of a hodgepodge, simply because I, while I do have some formal art training, I have half a degree, um, <laughs> most of of what I've learned, well, most of what I've learned that's really worth anything was entirely on my own. Just um, completely, uh, completely, you know, through freelance and just uh, like exper experimentation, mistakes, trial and error. Let me switch over to CSP. There we are. Um, and, um, I mean, that's really, I think that's, I think that's every artist. Everybody has to find their own workflow, which I want to talk about for a minute. Um, one of the things from the very beginning for me uh, as a professional artist was the tug of war between expression and precision. See, when you're, <laughs> when you're a little kid, you know, art comes easily. Everybody, you know, we all, we all draw as little kids. You know, we, we all express ourselves. Expression is there are no lines in expression. It's all this endless continuum of ideas that flow in and out of each other. It's only when you start doing art for a living that you run up against external structures like deadlines, <laughs> you know? Um, and what you do is suddenly, it suddenly feels constrained. It feels like, almost like, at, you know, in the beginning it can almost feel like the constraints are too much to get it right. Some of the previous panels have talked about, like, you know, getting it done versus getting it perfect. And I absolutely know what this... I, I know this feeling very well. Very, very well. Um, several of the um, comics I work on, I have had to very pointedly overcome the pitfall of... Uh, trying to like you know just bumping right up against the deadline trying to get all the time to things and you have to you, there is a threshold where there are some greebles where if you don't catch them then it's not going to look good but there are some where there's a point where if you try to get it too perfect you're going to just wreck yourself i mean the way the solution i found and it's just it's mine only is that you Basically, you treat it like you target what you can improve, you know, your own abstract processes that you use to, um, to, you know, to envision the art, the software you're using, the hardware you're using. Target those and build your efficiency there while letting the creative side of you coexist with the rest of it. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. That This is kind of where I'm going with this. Um... So the first thing I want to get on is the, uh, actually, let me, <laughs> here, let me put, here's, here's my intro card. I was going to show these. I forgot to, I was supposed to put this at the beginning, but anyway, there you go. There's me. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is helpful hardware and software. There's a lot of stuff out there, apps, you know, uh, devices, all kinds of stuff in modern ours to use. And 
I'm going to just do a quick overview of some of the options um, before I get into uh, the actual techniques and things like that. So here we've got a little. Here we've got a little sample of devices you can get. This is the one I swear by myself, the Clip Studio Tab Mate. Um, it's made for Clip Studio, obviously. Um, it's fairly cheap, uh, connects via Bluetooth. Older models connect by USB, and it's just really handy. You know, um, generally, it's great to have various functions accessible from your non-dominant hand while you're, you know, drawing with the other one so that you can, like, switch modes, zoom in and out, you know, add like, a, add, add layers, whatever, you know, whatever works best for you. And this is a good tool for that. There are a lot of other options. There's the Turbox Neo, which is a bit more expensive. I don't have this one, but several of my friends swear by it. Um, for a while, uh, I was using the Razer Tartarus, um, which is actually made for gaming, obviously, um, to, uh, to access functions. Um, it wasn't bad, but it's not specifically designed for our programs, so your mileage may vary. Um, the Wacom Express Key is another one. It's made by Wacom. Um, I've never had one myself, but again, some of my friends just swear by this. Oh, uh, let's see, Caitlin asks, how does it compare to the Wacom remote? I don't know. I, I need to get one of these and try it so I can tell you. Um, I think it's, if you're using CSP, uh, the tab mate is the best option because it has uh, specific functions that tie directly into the program. Um, beyond that, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I have also, I've never had a hardware-based stream deck, but you, you guys all know this one. You know this one. Um, this is, I've seen people adapt this to a number of different programs, 2D and 3D, and I have the software version. I have like the one that, you know, is on your phone. It's not bad. It's not bad. It, um, it's not, it lacks the specificity of devices like the TabMate, but this is good if you just want a bank of functions to, you know, with, you know, with the, uh, LED readouts showing you what you're doing. Um, Geomifix, what's make you, what, make, what makes you think I'm caffeinated, hmm? Um, <laughs> Other options include, you know, they, they're like keyboards like the Corsair keyboards with ha with a million little macro buttons, which are again designed for gaming, but you can use them for whatever. You can get you can get mice with up to twelve buttons, you know, like the Razer. I had one of these too. Um, this didn't work out so well for me because uh, I had to switch between the mouse and the stylus, so it wasn't necessarily the best option for rapidly switching uh, between functions. Um, loop deck, same thing as the stream deck, but more expensive. <laughs> um, if you're using uh, Wacom uh, hardware and software, you can actually set it up so that in the um, within the you know within the Wacom menu, you can set it up to have a radial menu that pops up when when you uh, push a key or I guess to one of the buttons, which is what I was doing for a while. This is my uh, custom radial menu for CSP. And uh, this is yet another option. There are lots of options. The latest one that I've seen is uh, Clip Studio Paint's companion mode, where you actually turn your phone into a secondary control uh, over over Wi-Fi that lets you do things like pinch and zoom, change your change your palette color, stuff like that. Um, I've tried this one. It's good. Um, it's it's not perfect. It needs a little work and. The thing with all of these is it kind of depends on what you want to be doing in terms of like your attention flow when you're uh, when you when you use this program. Do you want something tactile where you don't have to look at it? Are you okay with breaking you know breaking attention for a second and looking at the thing so you can twist knobs or push buttons or whatever? Do you feel more comfortable with a keyboard, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So this is this is the kind of thing where you really want to think about how you, how you work, um, and whether or not, like how important immersion is when you're in the middle of a program like this, because for some people it's really important. For me, it is very important to stay just in the zone. If there's too much going on, uh, I can't, you know, th then even if I take a break and come back to it, I may have lost some of the flow that I was in. So for me, the tab mates, 
the best thing. It's tactile. It's fairly simple in design, and you don't really have to look at it to know what you're doing. So that's hardware. Um, let's see. Let's get into software a little bit. So I'm just going through my little my little crib sheet here. Um, let's drop this in. Um, a few universally useful applications to assist you with art. Um, the Handy app exists, I believe, on Android and iPad, and I think there is also I think there's a Windows version. Anyway, um, this is uh, exactly what it looks like. It has hands in different poses, um, which you can manipulate to a degree. Uh, hands are especially difficult. Any artist will tell you hands are especially difficult because of these finely articulated, multi-jointed, you know, um, things. <laughs> and you can absolutely uh, use apps like this as assistance when you're working. I usually have like my tablet right next. I mean, I should say, I'm sorry. I have my graphics tablet next to my regular tablet. And then usually this app up on that when I need to do a complicated hand pose. Um, this is absolutely uh, worth checking out. Um, I don't think it's free. I think it's paid, but really it's worth it. Art pose is one of many apps uh, like this, there, there are a lot these days. There are all kinds of mannequin type apps where you can do dynamic poses and toggle muscles and bones and whatnot, you know, add lighting. And honestly, these are kind of invaluable. Um, these are good in the visualization phase and they're good in the, like the phase where you're working at the anatomy and stuff like that. There's just, they're endlessly useful. Um, art poses one, it's the one I've, uh, uh, gone in with. Um, there are a lot of other ones they're worth, uh, they're worth exploring, definitely. Pure Ref, uh, is essentially just sort of a sandbox that you drop, um, reference images into. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can, I mean, okay, you can actually use, I mean, Clip Studio Paint and many other programs have reference windows built in. Clip Studio Paint is called the Subview, and I just have it docked over here. Um, and you can just throw stuff in there if that's more comfortable for you. Um, I like PureView because it lets you organize stuff independently of the program and have these big clusters. Like CSP will only let you have a single image in here at a time, and then you have to page through them if you have multiple ones. This will just let you have a big mess of them. And then you can organize them as needed um, and just have that sitting you know, next to the program. Again, this is sort of like how you're workflow and your attention flow works, whatever works best for you. Um, let's see. Eagle is one that Caitlin uh, clued me into. It's very cool. It's really organized. I probably need to use it more often. <laughs> um, it'll just, if you want to get really super nitty gritty with the um, image organization, like if you, if you always have a lot of reference images that you're constantly, uh, indexing and pulling from then you want something like this where you can keyword them and search them and just organize them by date or time or subject or what have you so yeah this one is really good um let's see what else one that i discovered relatively recently or rather i should say rediscovered because i think someone pointed me to it and then i forgot all about it and then rediscovered it and and I thought, okay, this is useful. I should tell people about this, is Notepad++. Um, it's a pretty standard enhanced Notepad type program. I think it's specifically aimed towards coders, but it works really well for artists because if you're like me, you find big blocks of text in commission descriptions or any kind of, any kind of textual description from which you need to source a comic concept or a visual concept of any sort. Um, kind of, there's kind of this difficulty point sometimes where you're translating from the prose to the image, mainly because the way an image is structured is conceptually inherently different from the way a descriptive paragraph is structured. There's no way around that. It's just the difference between language and, and 
visualization. So you can see here that what I've done, this is, you know, an example commission, um, where I have specifically highlighted blocks that correlate, like, you know, I'm mentioning the, the OC, which is mine, you know, what he's doing, that, that's all in the cyan, the, the cyan color there. The, you know, information about the, the background is in purple, and then little details, you know, like the other OC are in orange and yellow. You kind of get where I'm going here? Like, get the, this is this is only one solution. There are other programs like this, but get this, give it a try, see if it works well for you. Um, one of the things I'm going to keep coming back to is that this is very much about customizing your workflow based around not just what works for you, but what feels right, and that's an intuitive process. That's an intuitive process because you really have to uh, kind of observe yourself and get a sense for how you react to using a particular tool or a particular workflow or whatever and whether or not it feels right. I'll get more into that later because that's a whole other topic, but let's move on. Clip Studio Paint, useful tips and features. What about Clip Studio Paint? It's not the only thing out there, obviously. Many people like Krita. Um, prior to discovering this program, I used Paint Tool Sty pretty religiously. Prior to that, I was using Adobe software. Um, and there's other stuff. There's Fire Alpaca, Medibang, um, all kinds of programs that do this sort of thing. And you should definitely uh, explore them on your own. Just to see what's available and how it feels. Um, another one I was trying for a long time was Art Rage. And it's great for, Art Rage is a great one for fine arts kind of stuff, you know, smeary paint effects. But I've defaulted to CSP simply because it's, you know, it's what, it's what all my, all the production teams of mine use. And it's kind of right now it's kind of the gold standard. You know, whether or not it remains that way, you know, is, we'll see. But for now, it's uh, it's what I like to use. There are probably analogous functions to a lot of what I'm about to describe in other programs. You know, like for example, mirror flipping, that's that's in most paint, modern paid programs these days. <laughs> Stuff like that, there's probably a way. Um, I'm get, Most of what I'm gonna discuss from this part forward just applies to CSP, but your mileage may vary. Now, for those of you new to this program, jumping into it often feels like this. You know, it feels like you're, there's a million little bobbers and, you know, knobs and dials everywhere. And it's extremely densely packed and kind of intimidating. And I completely understand that. Um, <laughs> I wish I had a solution other than to suggest arranging it the way you know the, the way that feels good for you the way i have it right now my little layout here is kind of a holdover from when i was using other programs like photoshop or sai i always like to have the uh you know the the color wheel up in the upper left hand corner not for any specific reason it's just it's where my brain likes to have it you know, the tools on the left side, the, the sub-tool information over here on the left, and the brush size down here, layers over here, et cetera, et cetera. It's essentially sort of a watered-down Adobe default layout. Um, I also, one of the nice things about CSP is that it lets you have this little dock up here, if you want it, where you can have banks of, um, of custom tools that you prefer over here up top um, and you can also color code your tools which is really good for me because I'm very color oriented I really like to have things um, with identifying hues and that just works well for my uh, for my particular uh, setup so uh, let's see what was I going to I don't again this is a sort of thing where I don't really have time to go over all of it. I really wish I did. I really wish I did because there's so much. There's all these 
there's a million little things in this program. Um, I will go over some of the really important control panels that you want to be working on. Um, do yourself a favor if you have a touch-based tablet um, and you're using this program. Go into Preferences under Touch Gestures. And if you like to do a lot of swiping, set up the gestures here so that it works for you. Um, I don't do a whole lot of like pinch and touch, pinch and zoom stuff on the tablet just because I prefer, with, in this particular context, I prefer to use the tab mate. Um, but this is really useful. Um, again, set this up the way that works best for you because if you do the wrong gesture, it's gonna, it's gonna break you out of that workflow. But um, this is, what I have here is pretty much default. I haven't really messed with these. Um, so set that up, um, be sure and set up your shortcut keys too. Those are really important. Um, again, this is if you're sort of keyboard oriented. Um, if, uh, if you prefer doing everything with the stylus, then your best bet is to set it up, you know, set up the um, functions in, in the Wacom or, you know, whatever brand it is, you know, just the, the stylus functions in the tablets control panel and figure out what you want. Like, for example, I've got the uh, the button, the, the forward button on my Wacom Stylus to do grip because that is that is the most common function, the, the biggest go-to for me um, when I'm on a canvas like this. <laughs> Let's see what else. Oh, the quick access menu. So the quick access menu is a pop-up when a pop-up submenu within CSP that because of the way OBS captures uh, the main window, you wouldn't see it if I if I popped it up, but I, I did a screenshot of my particular quick access menu. Um, you can set this thing up however you like. You can access it by a keystroke, the tab mate, you know, a again, a button on your stylus, whatever you like. Um, I think for me, mine pops up when I do like control alt Q I think but anyway this is just sort of like it's there and then once you uh once you click on an option it despawns you can also make it persist if you want but the idea is just fast switching so here i've got the most basic color options opacity options popping up the color wheel palette the color set palette miscellaneous tool switching size changing for your for your brush etc etc so another one that i wish i could show you but um unfortunately it's again a floating window that obs wouldn't capture properly um is the sub tool detail window this one is sort of like you have if you look over here on the left you have tool property which is your basic tool property <laughs> menu <laughs> lets you pick out simple things like brush size and opacity anti-aliasing stabilization but if you really want to get into the deep stuff into the deep lore then you go to the sub tool detail menu which is contextual and tends to change per tool um you can see you've got stuff like color jitter which is fun but mostly just for you know making stuff look pastelish Anti-aliasing, which is useful when you're doing inking. Brush shape, which is useful for artistic stuff. Um, but the ones I really want to take a minute and uh, talk about are correction and anti-overflow, because these are very specifically useful when you're doing comics. In fact, before I even get into these, I want to get into something else that probably not everyone knows about. I'm sure some of you do, but probably not everybody. Um, there are two kinds, well, there are more than two kinds of layers, but there are, there are two important kinds of layers in CSP. There is a raster layer where if you zoom in close enough to a raster layer, you'll start seeing the pixels because it is, it's a raster, a grid of image information where each pixel has various values. And then there are vector layers which are made entirely out of math and infinitely scalable because math itself is infinitely scalable. Vectors are essentially, 
mathematical descriptions of lines in space. You can see that they're represented by control handles that I can pull around. If you've used Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape or Psy, you're probably familiar with this. Um, CSP's implementation of vectors is fairly robust. I can do a lot of funny little things with them and tweak them as necessary. And this is really, really useful with inking, which I will get into later. But anyway, one of the uh, great things about the sub tool menu is that it lets you finally control how, um, hold on one second, let me get back to where I needed to be. Um, you can finally control how things on raster layers and vector layers interact. And that's really important when you're doing things like flatting for comics. Okay, for, uh, you, don't, <laughs> you don't need to know the math to do vectors. You can kind of intuit it by practicing, skating around with them a little bit. You'll get a feel for what they can do just by, by you know, let me show you. I know that, believe me, I understand exactly how you feel about the math stuff. Um, let me pull up, let me make a vector. There we go. If you go to like, you know, like you'll see things like options like Bezier curves and whatnot and different, uh, different forms of, actually, let me, let me pull up continuous curves as a good example. Where is that option? There we go. So this uh, continuous curves is a good option because it shows you the different kinds of curves you can create. All of which I'm familiar with, but that's only because like out of necessity. Like I can set it to do just like sharp splines. I can set it to do quadratic beziers which sound really fancy but basically it's just sort of like you're just sort of snaking it around and then we've got like cubic beziers which is just a different bezier formula the bottom line is it just lets you do different kinds of combinations of curves and joints and other fancy stuff yes exactly quantity versus smooth and sometimes both. If you want lines to stay crunchy and milk, try those Bezier curves right now. Available at your local uh, supermarket. Okay. Um, anyway, before I get too far on a tangent. So. Here we've got correction, which uh, essentially will correct a line as you're creating it and afterwards which I'll, I'll demonstrate right now and then we've also got like overflow which we'll get into in a minute when you're making a vector line um it might be a little bit wobbly especially if you have an unsteady hand which i do i don't i, my, I have i don't have the best hands for art i'm actually like it i i i'm a little shaky uh, sometimes and um i'm also very heavy with my uh, with with my grip on the uh, on the stylus, so what I usually do is I have correction set pretty high, I have stabilization pretty high, and it gives you options to uh, it gives you options to adjust the amount of stabilization by speed, which I also have on, and then then there's also post correction, which changes the line after you've done it. Like if I turn it off, it's like see so you no know, change. And then if I turn it up pretty high and then do a line, it will automatically straighten out. I vary this depending on the task. If I have to ink something with a lot of precision, like let's say it's like a big swooping arc, I will definitely have post correction up high. Um, and then if necessary, if it doesn't quite correct it to, the, to my liking, I'll go in using the control point uh, vector control and then do fine tweaking as needed until it looks really good. If it's something where it doesn't have to look exact, like if it's okay, if, it, if it's a little bit off or even if it's an organic shape where exactness would be unnatural, then I'll turn post correction off or have it on a very low setting. 
And that's just incredibly useful uh, when you're, uh, again, this is, this is, we're sort of in the, I'm sort of jumping ahead to the inking phase, but I uh, wanted to go ahead and mention this right now, just because uh, this is, uh, this is definitely worth knowing. Okay. So another one down there, vector magnet, um, another really useful um, vector related inking tool. If you turn on vector magnet and push it up high, which I'm going to do right now, then if you draw something, a vector adjacent to another vector, it'll connect it. Wait, hold on. There, it connected them. See, it, it just sort of, it snapped a little bit of the end over and just put, turn them into one single line. This is great. Uh, I mean, the, the, there's, you know, there's a number of uses for this, but this is especially good if you're like me and you're prone to doing little gaps like that. <laughs> so you just kind of go like that and it'll take care of a lot of the troubles for you. Freeing you up to do your thing. Okay. So let's see. What else did I want to write? Anti-overflow. So this one is great if you're a flatter. Um, that is to say, for those of you who don't know, a flatter does the initial flat colors on on a webcomic. And then either hands it off to a shader or does the shading themselves. Either way, let's say you're the flatter and you are taking care of the regions on these wiggly lines. So what I do is I set over in my layers palette, I take this layer right here and I set it as the reference layer, which is a layer, a, a special layer in CSP that other layers will refer to when doing things like fills. So the easiest way, of course, to fill an area like this is just with a, a fill bucket. That, whoops. <laughs> as I was saying, uh, damn it. <laughs> Sorry, I had my settings off. Um, okay, so this is the easiest way, obviously, but this isn't always the optimal way. Sometimes when you're using a fill bucket on a raster layer, and it has to be a raster layer for fills, um, you'll get little gap areas like this. You can see that some of the background's shown through right there. So pesky. So one thing you can do uh, is you pick a specific pen that you want to use for flatting, right? And then in the control panel, you go over here to anti-overflow and you click do not cross lines of reference layer. Now, when you jump in here, it'll respect those lines, which makes your life a lot easier once again. It's just one less thing to think about. Does this always work as a foolproof? No, but it's not bad. You can also instruct, you can also do specific instructions like do not cross the center of the reference layer. You can you can fine tune how it interacts with the vector lines, things like that. Um, this also works surprisingly enough for sketch start because even if there's no exact vector, even if it's if the reference layer is a raster layer, it will still try to approximate the uh, its understanding of the uh, boundary. Let's see what else did I want to. I'll get more into this later. Um, let me see what I have next. All right, we talked about the apps. We talked about the app tweaks. I want to talk about a few more specific useful features in CSP. Stuff that, uh, some of this is unique to the program. Um, and I will do my best to explain it. If, uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to try and do some Q&A uh, after all this. So if you have any questions, write them down. So obviously, the you know, when you go to the layer palette, you can just pick whatever layers you want and you can organize them as needed. You can have subfolders and layer labels and layer color coding and whatnot. Um, but let's say for a minute that you've got this little red blob 
and you don't know what layer it's on. You know, it's just somewhere in the stack and you're looking at it and you're not sure. You pick the select layer tool and click on it and that brings you to the layer it's on, no matter where that layer is in the stack. This is really useful if, you know, if you've got stuff floating around in a million layers. Um, it's not foolproof because if you have another layer above it and that layer has stuff on it, even if it's transparent, it'll select that layer. But it's really useful. Um, if, if you're uh, prone to, um, if you label your layers, like let's see, give this layer a name, red blob. There we go. And then let's say I have another layer called red something else. <laughs> um, another really useful thing is to search layers via the search layer palette. So let's say I type in red. I have to set the type because you can, you can have a bunch of different types of layers. Here now it's giving me the results red blob and red something else. Let's say I just type in blob. There, now it only comes up with red blob. So if you, with a little bit of planning and keywording, you can organize your layers in a way that you don't ever lose anything. Um, I've taken to doing this with some of the comics I work on where uh, if, if the creator themselves doesn't layer them, then I'll go in and kind of layer them myself just for my own uh, purposes. Um, again, these little time savers add up. You know, it doesn't, it seems like it's only, it's not a huge shortcut, but when you're, you know, going, you know, four or five hours a day on these things and, you know, you can, you can shave an hour off just because you've got, you know, a million little things that you do. It definitely makes a difference. Um, let's see. What did I want to, I already go went over quick menu. Um, I went over sub view. Um, sub view uh, is really great if you want to just drop stuff in like so and sample it for colors and whatnot. And because it's in CSP, you can also pull it out and dock it wherever is convenient for you. So this might work better than, say, pure ref, but um, it's, uh, it's kind of personal preference. Um... What else? Oh, the, the, the color mixing. Let me pull that one up too. This one, here, let me dock it so you can see it. This is a relatively new feature. It's a little color mixing palette within CSP. Let me uh, make a few color regions. Essentially, it's the digital equivalent of one of those little um, mixing spots you have on paint palettes where you just kind of goop everything together and make a mess. <laughs> It has its own undo set, and uh, it's kind of a little, a nice little sandbox for coming up with new palettes and whatnot. Um, if you like this sort of thing, especially if you come from a painting background, which I don't, but it, you know, if you do, then this is great. This is a lot of fun. And what you can do is you can apply any tool that you can use in the main canvas to this little mini canvas. So if you want to have, say, let me pull up something textured. So if you want to use like a fancy blend to like have some nice little textured stuff going, then you can do that. So that's a useful little thing that you might like. Um, what else did I want to... Oh, let's talk about garbage cleaner. Um, garbage cleaner is a great little function where if you happen to miss a few tiny little pixels here and there, you know, regardless of what other fill tools you're using and you're doing like the last inspection, well, the last quote unquote inspection pass before you submit it to the uh, editor or whoever. And you need to just quickly um, eliminate these little spots without thinking about them too much. You go to garbage cleaner, um, and then just kind of draw a line and it doesn't quite catch all of them, but
but you can see how it catches a lot of them. It's something you use in tandem with other stuff. There's also fill left over, which, you know, is kind of a similar thing, etc., etc. And um, none of these little cleanup tools are foolproof. There's always an exception where no matter what, if you're using all the cool fills and everything else, there's always going to be that one tiny little pixel. And you probably won't notice it on the first pass or even the second pass. It'll probably be after you've uploaded and somebody comments like, hey, you missed a spot. And you're just like, thank you. I appreciate your feedback. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure anyone who's made web comics knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, these uh, these all exist to uh, make your life easier. And unfortunately, because of the like once again because of the sheer density of Clip Studio Paints Loud, these can often go unnoticed <laughs> until somebody tweets about it. And you're like, oh, well. <laughs> Huh. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. We're about 40 minutes in so far. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'll find a way to fill it all out. Um, let's talk about the actual comic making process. I don't really consider myself like a serious comic artist. I, I feel like I've gotten good at it and I can, I can do it. I've done like, I've done my own, done plenty of my own comics. Um, I, I feel like it's something where I can apply a lot of the uh, visual art stuff I've learned, but there are definitely folks, peers of mine who, will always be, you know, who I always consider to be better at it than me. And, and that's not that's not me being down on myself. That's me understanding my own limitations. And I feel like, that's why I feel more comfortable being part of a team, like the Tamerlane team. I help, uh, I help Caitlin out with inks when I can. Uh, or, you know, being a flatter for some of Rick Griffin's comics, which I am. Um, or other, you know, other assistive roles in other comics projects. Um, being part of a team, ideally, not always, but ideally means that whatever weaknesses you might have are complemented by others' strengths. Um, you know, in the uh, during the Fox Club session, they talked about this a little bit. And it's, of course, it's possible to be a part of a team where that doesn't work at all because of weak command structure or people's you know people having the same problems or just personality clashes ask me how i know about that i've <laughs> i've never been in a in part of a comics team where i had major conflicts but i i have had jobs like office jobs where things just broke down because of people would talk different languages not not literally different languages but they would have different like organizational languages that's what i mean you know like one you know one of the team members would have a very specific time-tested way of handling things to get you know to get a given task finished and then in comes the rookie who at that point was me <laughs> who has a very different way of doing things and if you have a good boss who can orchestrate all of this and you know understand these functional um, quirks and make it all work, then the whole team works. I'm very, I'm very proud of the fact that on like Rick's team and Caitlin's team, everybody's just rocking it. Like they are just, you know, they're, they're my friends, but they're also incredibly uh, just talented and efficient people who have learned to be this whole that is greater than some of its parts. And that's where I feel really comfortable. So I'm really, really just super grateful for that. Um, but, by, <laughs> but by myself, it has been a bit of a, bit of a mixed bag. Um, it's why I have not struck out 
on my own as far as like web, web comics in a long time. I did have a web comic around 2006. Um, it wasn't very good. I was inking it in Flash and I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. That's it. I do have a fine understanding of many of the parts of the process. Excuse me. And I can tell you about some of the little things I've discovered within that. So, let's get into it. Consulting my little list. Okay, so, one of the things, I mean, I, I've always known that it's best, if not, you know, absolutely necessary to do a rough prior to sketching, you know, laying down the pencils on a drawing. And usually this is what I would do. Whenever I draw without really thinking about what I'm drawing about, it's always going to be my OC looking annoyed while probably sipping coffee. Um... <laughs> But um, one thing that I really had to get drilled into my brain over and over again before I really understood it was the necessity for pre-visualizations. What I mean by that are, you know, most people call them thumbnails. But um, what you do is instead of trying to get it right the first time, the con you take the concept and you try a couple of different angles, a couple of different you know layouts, a couple of different lighting setups. Like here, let's just you know let's just go with what we've already got. Jonas drinking coffee. I do a little thumbnail of the brooding OC. You know there he is, sitting at the cafe, brooding. You know. There's, uh, and this is, you know, it's a very kind of standard angle. This is, you know, this is how you would see him if you were just standing there. But what could we do with this? Where could we take this? What would make it more interesting? What would give it a different emotional texture? What if you were up close to him, like you were sitting across from him? This immediately feels a little more confrontational, doesn't it? He's not looking at you, but you still it still feels like you're kind of the object of his ire. <laughs> it still has all most, if not all, the same visual information, and maybe you see some other some of the other uh, uh, patrons of the shop behind them. But the but the concept is conveyed a different way, and even though you don't always have time to do this in a comics project, having it be one of the tricks in your bag is really useful. So here's another angle, another common angle you'll sometimes see in comics where it's like, you're up in the ceiling. <laughs> Here you don't see him at all. It feels a little bit more distant, uninvolved, you know? This feels kind of like, like there'd be, you know, film noir style narration. I was sitting there at the coffee shop drinking my coffee. Etc. Etc. Um, and then for yet another one, we've got like the the worm's eye view, where we're like <laughs> we're down here, like on the floor, uh, next to the uh, next to the table. Obviously, you wouldn't necessarily use all of these, or or, or, or even you know like any of these or whatever. It depends on the particular story you want to tell. And very often, you know, you'll be, uh, if you're part of a team, someone else is going to make the call for you. Like, let's say I submit this to my boss and she says, oh, I like this one. I like number two. Go with that. So now, assuming I have the time for it, I would do a couple of value studies. Like, some of this will be dictated by mood. Some of it will be dictated by... Um, you know, stuff like time of day, but basically what I'm doing now, whoops, what I'm doing now 
is I'm going to quickly block these in with a couple of possible value sets. Like, first one, Jonas is in shadow because he's brooding, huh? Then the patrons behind him are in a slightly lighter shadow. And then the actual coffee shop itself, the background, is bright. So that's one option. Another one. The coffee shop is dark. The patrons are middle key. And then Jonas is the highlighted thing. This is more pro this would be more appropriate for like like a nighttime thing where the glow is coming from his laptop, but it doesn't have to be. Um yet another option. And so on. So these kinds of things help you really shape the idea in your head. It's kind of essential to the design process, but more than that, it really helps you understand kind of an implicit part of the picture, which is the feel, you know, the mood, the, the atmosphere, which isn't always obvious. Very often it's uh, influenced by things like expressions or narrative or whatever is there a, you know is there a story and how can the how can the lighting and by extension like the color play into it what's what story can the color and the shadows and the light tell that doesn't have you know and what you know what story can the camera angles tell a lot of all of hollywood's greatest directors have explored this stuff one of my personal favorites is spielberg because i'm from the 80s you know and one of the things he does that i just absolutely love is the 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 warm light like whenever he does a scene where like a family's having dinner there's going to be like you know there's going to be like a warm incandescent light source usually um stuff like that or um particular uh, particular camera angles let me find a good let me find the well instead of doing an example I'll just you know you know he'll do something like this where you see whatever object the main character is looking at is and th the main character is looking at it in awe and then he does the shot where the character's like off center staring at it and the light's usually like framing him doing the Indiana Jones hat. Um, with the option of like the warm glow, etc. You get the idea. And you don't overtly think about this stuff until you're actually manipulating the layouts, until you're in charge of that part. But really, this is pretty central to art. And when it comes back down to efficiency, what you do is you figure out your own vocabulary. You, you know, you look at directors you like, you look at shows you like, you look at comic artists you like. Um, you pick apart the, the, the size of the, sh of the panels, the shape. You, you take a minute and think about like, okay, how does this affect me emotionally? What kind of, you know, how does this add to the mood or subtract from it, you know? And then you start using that as your own, you start consciously using that as your own vocabulary when you're working on this stuff. Um, CSP helps support this by having a whole bunch of, let me pull them up, a whole bunch of frame templates, which is really useful. So you just pop one of these in, these are pretty standard. And then you can also uh, use, where is that pesky tool? There it is, the frame tool to just slice them up as needed. Like, beep, there you go. Anyway, moving on. What's next? What's next? What's next? It bears repeating that one really good site for brainstorming is Pinterest. Um, it has so many you know there's, there's there's so many great collections but also if you deliberately curate your feed and stuff it full of things that you like if you just add a lot of you know if you add a lot of favorites it'll start 
giving you ideas, you know, pins uh, and new ideas that you perhaps haven't thought of, but are nonetheless sort of correlated to what you've already, uh, you know, what you've already thought up and shared. Um, figuring out your aesthetic, aside from the fact that it's just a lot of fun, you know, just not figuring out really, finally figuring what you like is another way to really build that instinct when you're drawing. You'll find that if you cultivate things like that, like mood boards and mind maps of just themes and visual concepts and ideas that you love and really get obsessed over them, it'll start coming to you intuitively. You're like, you, you know, like you'll be, you know, you'll be doing a pose and you might, you might get this flash of intuition about like different ways you could position it, different things you could add, different attitudes you could convey. Um, and it becomes this sort of like unconscious wealth of information that you can draw on like a pool. And it's just, it's so, it's so good. But you have to start at a conscious level. You have to start at a conscious level and really just pursue it. There's, <laughs> there's kind of this stigma in society about getting obsessed with something. You know, there's this feeling that, oh, you can't get too obsessed with something or it'll, it'll be to the detriment of the rest of your life. And that can happen. You can get obsessed with anything, any hobby, any aesthetic, any anything, especially in art, um, to the point that it's taking up too much of your time. But that can be anything, you know. That can be that, that can be anything. And the key, of course, is balance. I mean, this is true with any kind of avocation, but especially with stuff like this, where you let yourself go long enough to find that inspiration and then, and then reel yourself back in so that you can complete the deadline. <laughs> so let's see, what's next, what's next? Um, one really good site I want to drop, let me, uh, let me find the link. It's both a website and a series of books. Mike Batizzi's, um Force Method. Let me uh, let me post that link. I'm sorry, moderators. Our link's okay. Can I can I can I share links in the chat? I want to I want to check with that before I drop the link. Mike Matizzi's Force Method is a really fantastic way of visualizing dynamic poses. Where I'll just go ahead and like do a sketch just to illustrate. Where obviously you've got gestural stuff where you're accustomed to uh, the general flow of complex forms like the human body, you know, where if, you know, for example, if you're like sketching like a, like a ballerina doing a, you know, like a, like, like a jump or something, you'll have, you know, this, the implicit flow within the body as described by like, the moving masses of the chest, the torso, the hips, the spine, etc. But Matisse's force method also talks about how you have to be aware of the uh, oh, let me change colors, the force acting on the body. And it's not like it's not there's no you know you wouldn't draw this line, but you are aware of it because this is the force as propelled through the uh, through the jump and sometimes you do want to sketch it for poses like this because it informs both the uh, gestural part and sometimes it also ex it, it also applies to the range of motion of other parts because nothing in a, in a body no muscle in a body moves like unless you're okay in a natural motion everything moves a little bit. Obviously, if you're swinging a bat, your feet aren't gonna move a lot, but they do move a little bit. Um, and it is of course possible to move just one muscle, just crook your finger if you want to, but generally that's not the case. Usually everything moves a tiny bit. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here pivoting in my seat and you can't see it, I should use my webcam. Um, but that's kind of what the force method is about. It's kind of like, okay, what's acting on 
a body in a given pose. And forces can be internal as in originated from the muscle groups or they can be external, for example, you know, like Batman punching the Joker, you know, like boom. So you've got, you know, Yeah, there's my there's there's the Joker. Um So obviously you have the gestural the curved gestural line, you know, of the reaction. And then you've got the force line coming through Batman's fist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is great for visualization just because if a pose feels static, if it feels dead, even after a few revisions, then it helps to think about the forces acting on the pose and not just the pose itself. Uh, let's see. What else? What other little goodies can I share? Oh, yeah, let me, I'm sorry, I forgot to, forgot to drop the link. Um, I'm just going to assume that this is okay. If it's not mods, feel free to delete it. Um, fair warning. Um, uh, good night, Mrs. Hazel. Thank you so much for a wonderful panel. Uh, we all really appreciate it, and you have just you've dropped lots of fantastic wisdom. So just thank you so much. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. There's a, there's a lot. I have like these very disorganized notes um, that I should probably try to put together a little bit better so that when I'm doing things like this, it's not me mumbling into the microphone. <laughs> um, oh, right. Let me start a new one here. So this is a little trick. These are a couple little tricks that I've learned um, with regard to penciling that can be useful. Um, another relatively new feature in Clip Studio Paint is Liquify, um, which is sort of like a more um, dramatic version of Blur, where it will specifically do things like this. And Distorting forms isn't always necessarily something you want to do, but it can be useful in kind of specific use cases. Like if you feel a pose isn't quite working, one thing you can do, excuse me, is use things like the expand liquify to push it in a direction. You know, it doesn't give you, like you wouldn't want to use this as a final pose, but you can see how it changes the shape language a little bit. And then from that, you can get a sense of maybe where you want to take it, you know? Um, everything's a process. Everything's a work in progress. You're never completely finished with an image. That's just a reality you have to accept. You're never finished. There's just a point where the boss is like, what's going on? Is it done? <laughs> and you're like, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that's one thing you can do. You can use liquify um, to play around with that. You can also take um, a lasso marquee and start stretching and transforming different pieces of it. You can also do a, like a gradient mesh transform from edit transform mesh transformation and do it this way if this is more comfortable for you. Again, this is not necessarily what you want to do for your final piece, but it is something that... Uh, you can use to play around with different possibilities. Now, another little trick I learned is that you can have pencils on a vector layer, okay? So you can even sketch like this. And this is all, you know, it's all, it's all vectors you can control. So what you can do is lay down some essentially rough pencil work and then use things like vector magnet to connect the lines and forms um, or tweak them after the fact the way, you know, just like so. And it still retains that pencil quality. This is, this is unique to CSP. I have not encountered this in other programs. Um, 
but uh, that's that's something you can do, and it is just super useful for visualization. I'm very much about playing around with lots of visualization, visualization prior to finalizing any given phase of a drawing because while you're under a time crunch, if you allow yourself, this again gets back to that whole precision versus expression thing where if you give yourself the space to do a little bit of creative expression and a little bit of lateral thinking so that you have a couple of ideas very often you could come up with a result that even though you didn't know it to begin with, it's closer to the real intention, the real soul of what you're trying to create. And yes, this doesn't always apply. And out of necessity, sometimes you can't always do all that lateral stuff, you know, especially if the deadline's tight or it's not appropriate for the project or whatever. But again, this is something you want to have in your, your mental toolbox and then connect it with the functions and programs like this to uh, bring it all together. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense in my head. There's a lot of stuff where I, it, I've worked it all out in my head and I've never actually said it to anyone before other than maybe like the, you know, the, the Fox Club folks. <laughs> and um, I'm hoping it's, uh, I'm hoping it's useful information. Um, does anyone have any questions thus far? Really, please feel free. <laughs> like, does, is what I'm saying making sense? Is any of it unclear? Am I am I going too fast? Am I do, should I elaborate on anything in particular? Let's do the artwork again. <laughs> well, if you insist. Note that you cannot use the liquify tools on a vector layer, but what you can do if you want is duplicate the vector layer, create a rasterized copy. Um, you rasterize stuff either in uh, layer rasterize from that menu, or you go to the layers palette, right click a context menu up on the layer and then rasterize from there. But um, then you could start it's a little processor intensive, but as long as you don't make it too big, you can start bobbing stuff around to your heart's content. I'm going a little too hard here, so it's getting kind of abstract, but um, any transformation can at least give you ideas. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be something useful, something that you can integrate into the final, but it gives you, it lets you think about things from a different perspective. And speaking of, one of the things that everybody should do at multiple phases is a mirror check. In CSP, it's navigator flip horizontal, pretty straightforward. So as I understand it, the reason why something can look just fine, let me draw Jonah's head. Just fine from one angle and then really weird from the counter angle is because the human brain really likes to uh, relax when things are familiar. Like it's sort of, it's similar to the whole thing where you see an after image. It's because your eyes have got, you know, like an after image when you're looking at a bright color because your eyes get fatigued a little bit. When everything is normal, the human brain stops being on alert. And then the second, you know, it's also why your reflection, you know, looks, can sometimes look odd. Like if you flip it, it's because you're, you're so used to seeing something one way that your brain stops thinking about it. And then when it, when it's reversed, just the reversal is enough to kind of snap that part of your brain to attention. Like something's wrong. Something's out of place. I better be, I better try and figure out what it is. So the first thing you'll notice is that something looks off without really knowing why. That's why the mirror check is so important. And if you really want to be absolutely sure while you're working on it that you're getting the good results, what you do is you spawn a second window. Let me get rid of some of these, hang on.
I also don't have a lot of tabs open. It's just, it's really messy. Um, you spawn a second window of the same project, tile them, and then you mirror one of them. And then as you're working, you can get a better sense on the fly of whether or not something looks right. And then you switch over to the other window, go to that one and maybe make corrections. Um, This method of working can, can be a little distracting. So again, it's something you should try and see if you like it or not, but it's an option. Just checking to see if anyone's uh, asked any questions. No questions so far, very well. Uh, let me see what else I have in my little bag of tricks. Let's talk about the inking phase for a minute. So I'm giving myself a couple of lines to ink. I go to the vector layer. I strongly recommend inking on a vector layer because it has more information on it. And usually vectors take up less file space because they're math and not uh, arrays of pixels. That's not universally true, but it is often true. Um, as mentioned before, uh, you can use things like vector magnets to join lines easily. Um, there is a vector eraser you can use that will slice vectors very nicely. Again, big time saver. Um, and there are also tools that you can, you can use to finally control the vectors. Like you've already seen me move control points around, but you can also add control points, delete them, which tends to simplify the line. You have to be careful with this, but this is something you can do. Um, you can change the types of corners, make them rounded or whatever. Um, you can change line width on a very granular scale, which is really good if you're like me and you want to have nice, thick, expressive lines here and there. Uh, it's really easy to go crazy with this, and uh, you got to be careful with that, but it is an option. Um, you can change the opacity of, of line segments, which is something I've never really found a use for. <laughs> like, hold on, let me... There, see, you can get this sort of faded effect if you like that. I never use this. I don't, I don't really see the point, but it's there. And you can split the line so that it becomes two lines. Well, it, it's supposed to be two lines. There we go, yeah. Um, all of these in tandem uh, make the whole business of making a lot easier. Redraw is another tool where if you don't feel like you quite got it right in the first pass, you can, uh, you can redraw it and have it simplify. The way it simplifies is a little inorganic, so you might not necessarily want to use this. But um, it also lets you, depending on the setting, it also lets you introduce little tiny flaws into it. So like if you wanted a really nice kind of organic, busy line, you could always do something like this. Um, you can also change the width of the line with CSP in total, like in bulk, or you can just say, oh, let's do a segment of it. Let's make a segment of it thicker which is again, good for expressive line weights and expressive line weights are great for just conveying mood or making an object look really solid. Like, you know, here I'll draw, draw like a cube. Like if you really want to sell that, that this thing is like heavy and sitting on a surface, you would enhance like maybe only the bottom part, really make that beefy. That's probably a little too much, but you get the idea. Fry, you brought up a good point about RAM. Um, the, the, the needs of modern programs like these are non-trivial. It's not quite as bad as, say, like 3D programs like games, but I have noticed sometimes that my CPU usage with CSP will jump 
abruptly, almost 200%, if not 200%, when I'm doing crazy effects like blurring or rescaling a lot of complicated vectors at once. Um, so it's good to have a modern computer for this sort of thing. I have a gaming PC, uh, kind of out of necessity. Um, so it can handle this pretty well. Um, CSP, as far as I know, CSP is not entirely optimized to take advantage of things like multi-core CPUs. Um, but it does okay. It does adequately. Um, talked about control points and about 45 minutes left. Um, let's see. Let's talk about flatting a little bit. Well, a little more, I should say. Um, I'm going to show you a little trick that I learned. Let me make some more lines over here that can be really useful for certain kinds of regions. So I did it on the I did it on the wrong layer. Yeah. Don't do what I just did. Yeah. So now that I put it on the right layer, um, excuse me. So we've got our vector layer. We go to layer ruler ruler slash frame submenu ruler from vector i now have these tiny little rulers right huh right parallel to well not parallel following the uh the inking curves i take that i use the little i drag the little layer icon out of the layer put it on the uh on a raster layer beneath put it on a raster layer beneath we go um and then up here up at the top i select snap to ruler and then i use the direct draw lasso fill and it will conform to the ruler but when i'm not but it only does that when it's close enough to snap to it so i can have kind of these hybrid shapes where it snaps to the ruler then when I pull away, it lets go, and I can do things like this. Um, how much it snaps is a function of how far you are zoomed out. Unfortunately, they don't have finer controls than that. You'll notice that like when I'm more zoomed out, the snap will be more uh, more aggressive. If you really wanna, if you wanna get in close, that gives you the best kind of control. Does that make sense? Um, the use for this is kind of niche, but nonetheless, when I found it, I was like, oh, people should know about this. Um, let's see. Oh, I want to tell you about erase compare. Yeah. So let's say you've got a little, a little off color spot. You want to get rid of just that. What you do is you in your in your blending mode menu you select erase compare and it didn't work of course it didn't work um <laughs> let me yeah, let me let me use one of the fill tools instead um let's try a close and fill that i'm trying to do a trick where you set it to erase compare and it gets rid of just the yellow dot um now that I'm actually streaming in front of an audience, I'm too nervous to remember how to do it. <laughs> but um, Erase Compare will compare two colors within a fill region. And if you're doing it correctly, it'll get rid of the one that you don't want, even if it's just like an isolated little island like that. Um, you'll have to take my word for it, because I... <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what else did I want to... Go over. I showed you the uh, ruler from factors trick. Hmm. Let me go ahead and fill these regions again with some more colors. So 
So there's a lot of different ways you could do shading, um, especially anything like web comics. I've seen, I've seen really simplified shading. Um, I've seen really incredibly lavish shading, like you'll find in Tamerlane. Um, and uh, there's just a hundred different ways. It really depends on how much time you have and what kind of vibe you want to go for. Shading is an incredible... Light and shadow are just a whole other complicated topic. Um, but I can, again, discuss what's worked well for me, uh, especially as something that's like, like a quick shortcut that nonetheless looks decent. Um, what I do, or one thing I like to do, is a correction layer, which is a, a sort of non-destructive editing layer that you add to the layer stack in the layers palette. You right-click on the layer you want to correct, go new correction layer in the context menu, and then pick, like I usually was like hue, saturation, luminosity. It's changing the values, but not actually, just in sort of a, an overlay kind of way. I'm going to clip it to the layer below so that it just kind of, it only shows over the pixels that are uh, relevant. And then I'm going to do quick mask using Q. I have aliased Q. And then I'm going to select a couple of regions with the intention of simulating a surface. Like, let's say, okay, there's going to be this one plane over here that's shaped like that. So there it is. There's the selection marquee. I take that under select. I say select chain convert to selection layer. So now that exists as its own thing. Let's call it face number one. Right. So now let's say I want to create another face for this little object, but I don't want it to overlap the first one. So I do this. Whoops. It's overlapping a little bit. Darn. Um, I convert that one to a selection layer as well. Let's give it a different color so that they're they are distinct. Uh, let's see. I believe that's layer settings. Well, at any rate, um, I select the first one. If I double click, if I double click on it, it selects, and then selecting the second one, and then pressing delete slices that overlapping bit out. So now I have these two distinct layers, these two distinct selection layers that don't, that abut each other perfectly, but don't intersect or leave any gaps, right? So now let's create some more faces using the same process. Whoops. Ah. And the nice thing about these features is that this all happens non-destructively. You can do this without making too much of a mess. This is again the sort of situation where it's good to layer, to, to label your layers so that you know what you're doing and where. So now we've got these selection layers. Um, face two, face three, face four. Face one's gonna be bright. So let's deselect all these after highlighting the selection. Let's create another correction layer for brightness. Let's crank up the brightness on this face, right? Face number one is going to, okay. Let's say face number four is going to be dark. So I select that one. Then on the uh, correction layer for hue, saturation, luminosity, I fill that one, just that one fill area. Okay. 
and so on and so forth. Um, let me do one more. The end goal here is basically to start with a nice organized set um, set of values and then to add texture, just very slight amounts of texture to blur them. With shading, less is more is definitely a valid philosophy because if your shading is too lavish and too laden with gradients, in my opinion, uh, it will become distracting. It'll become its own thing. Uh, and what, you know, whether or not that works for you is a personal choice. But um, I, I prefer to have, I found it more effective to have like small regions of transitions in shading and larger blocks overall of things like light and shadow because aside from being time saving, it adds to the design element. It's better to have large regions of shade that feel unified rather than lots of little smaller gradients that feel like they're their own thing. Does that make sense? <laughs> but yeah, this is a real quick way to do like just simple light and shadow. One thing I've noticed is that let me get like a nice textured sh shader right here. Very often, if you have the hint of texture, just like in the transitional regions, that's all you really need. You don't need to show that you don't have to have like the texture across the entire object, really just the corner areas, because that's where you tend to notice it the most. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me actually grab a piece of art. Let me find something that is Twitch appropriate. There we are. So in this instance, um, I uh, used a tone curve correction layer, kind of biasing the shadows towards blue. And then for the most part, it's fairly simple. There's fairly like, there's like hard transitions, but then there's like softer ones around like the pants, you know, and uh, like the hair areas where you'd expect to see a little more softness. That's another thing where if you, uh, you know, one thing you have to mind with certain objects is the quality of the shadows. Um, obviously some surfaces are gonna have very distinct transitions and other ones, like organic ones, are going to have like little. They're they're going to tend to be a little bit more blurry. But how much you use these effects is purely up to you. I also added a glow layer with the glow with the uh, glow blending method to uh, provide the light, and then a color balance layer to just kind of bias the entire image towards that warm glow. I just it's just a personal favorite of mine. Um. But you can keep going with this sort of thing. You can actually overcook it a little bit. Um, like, for example, let's say I want to put a color, like a gradient map on the entire image. You know, I could make it all kind of like bluish or boost the warmth too much or even invert the gradient and have like kind of this like washed out effect a little bit. I've inverted the gradient and then I set it to about 25% opacity. It gives you that faded photo quality. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> um, you can do all kinds of bonkers stuff with uh, correction layers. Like, let's see here. <laughs> let's say I do a tone curve layer and just only crank up the low reds. You get that feeling of a faded photo. Or, um, Conversely, if I crank up the blues, it gives you kind of that um, feeling of like a smoke, like, like, like if there's like smoke in the air, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if 
if you move the uh, high values down in a tone curve, you can also get the feeling of like, sort of a low key image, like something that's um, kind of darkened or obscured or something, you know, just a different kind of mood. And this is one of a myriad of effects you can achieve. Um, Let's see, what other little goodies do I have? One kind of shading I've gotten, <clears throat> excuse me, one kind of shading I've gotten fond of recently is um, using an inverted uh, subtract layer. So what you do is you, you have to do this with a layer folder. Um, the layer folder has to clip down to the base layer that you want to alter. And then within the layer folder, you start with um, a layer with set to, to subtract blending. You pick a hue. Um, and then what you do is you invert it. And I'm not sure why this looks good, but I really enjoy the results that this you can get with this. You invert the subtract layer using a reverse gradient correction layer. right? And then using a mask and opacity adjustment, you can really get this nice kind of saturated shading that looks really, uh, really good. Again, not totally sure why it looks good. It just does. This really gives you this really gives you a chance to have like really interesting colors in the shadows, and you can because. You could have more than one color in a layer. You can also do things like have like different hues within the shadows and then just blend those as needed. Hmm. almost out of goodies. Any questions? Any questions from the audience? Anything? Please, feel free. All right, doesn't look like anyone has any questions. Um, let me see. What else do I want to talk about? <laughs> How do you comic? Um, a frame at a time, pretty much. <laughs> you put the lime in the coconut. Um, <laughs> well, in the case of web comics, it's it's the optimization aspect is really important because you you're you're sometimes confronted with the question of how can you know you can you can spend all day on effects like this and then the question becomes how can you do it in a couple hours or an hour or five minutes and still have it look analogous to the way you want it to without actually taking as long you know as, as long as a full digital painting would um so that part that part's kind of a kind of tricky because there are an artist is always confronted with, with the situation where you know how to do it in your head. You don't, you know, or you, you can, you have a method, but then that method is, comes up against the constraints, the ever-present constraints of deadlines and standards and 
you know, the you know sometimes you'll have art direction where what you do has to look good against the rest of the the rest of the comic, like the background, maybe the background that someone else did. Um, sometimes you're constrained by issues like team communication where you have to be able to explain to someone else what you did so that they can replicate it as needed. Um, thank you, Caitlin. Thanks for stopping by. Take care. So as fun as, you know, the play aspect is, these are things you just have to be aware of. And that's exactly why I set out to create all these little shortcuts and stuff like that. Um, I should probably try and wrap things up. Um, I'm sort of thinking, I'm trying to think about what else to say. I ended up, I ended up going a little bit, er, a little bit uh, early here. Um. Another uh, site that I really, two sites that I really strongly recommend are Stan Prokopenko's website, which is great for um, anatomy, which is uh, proko.com. Uh, fair warning, Proko stuff does include, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's anatomy reference, so there is going to be an NSFW stuff there. It's all fairly tame, but nonetheless, be aware of that if you go there. Um, but he has a very long series of lots of just fantastic instructional videos on rendering and anatomical details. Um, anatomy is something that I wish I had more time to get into, but that's a huge conversation because there's not just with human anatomy it's not just the actual physiological details there's also the way it moves and the way humans use pose and expression to uh, convey language and emotion ideas and there's a lot there it's it really takes decades to really master it i have not really mastered it myself i've gotten good enough to uh, do this stuff and then there's and then there's the whole other aspect of how do you break it down into simple forms you know i mean you'll you'll you see, you've seen me doing like box shapes and you know like, the, like this bucket shape for the hips um i mean these are simplifications obviously real organic motion uh and organic forms are um more complex and People have been trying since antiquity to represent this stuff in a simplified way. You know, before even art had a proper concept of its own, you know, things like Greek statuary, which was, which was more ornamental than anything, has this, you know, flawless anatomy. You know, you know, so much of the Renaissance was devoted towards figuring out and reproducing the motion of bodies in space. And there is so much to unpack there it's just like i wish i could get into it all but that is a whole that is a whole art class that is that is a whole semester right there and years ago i'll tell you a story years ago uh, i had a friend who had a friend who worked at nicktoons like in the 90s um he gave me a tour of the studio on the weekend um over in glendale and I was kind of this, you know, this was when I was about 19 or 20, and I was really arrogant. Like, I just, you know, I thought I was this little know-it-all. And um, I I remember, like, debating with him, like, do you really have to, you know, if you're drawing a Mickey Mouse hand, do you really have to know anything about anatomy? And <laughs> he kind of, like, he was he was being very patient with me. He showed me how knowing fine anatomy still matters, even if you have a quote-unquote cartoony style, because a good cartoony style will distill down the uh, complicated forms into more simple ones. I'm not doing a very good hand here, but you get the idea. Like, 
the you know you can, you can you can get away with rubber hose hands if it's the 1920s and you're doing the silly symphonies cartoons but like yeah, you know, one of the reasons um, the Disney Renaissance of the '90s was so cool, was so awesome, is that they learned to really distill down complex forms into simple ones, while retaining, you know, the, the elegance and sweep of those forms. Um, and that, aside from being a great workaround to again improve the time spent, you know, rendering these things, is just visually striking because it's sort of like, it sort of becomes like cursive, you know, um, you're, you know, you're expressing a complex visual idea in a way that's so simple that it becomes very quickly eye catching without losing most of the information. And this is again, one of those things where it's hard to put into words. I know it all in my head. <laughs> um, and it's real tempting to go to just point to something and go, that's how you do it. See it? Just look at it and analyze it. And that's how you do it. Okay. Do it that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, the reason why some of this is stuff, some of the stuff is hard to express, even for seasoned artists, is because it has its own visual language it has a language that has nothing to do with like verbal syntax again this kind of gets ties back into how i have trouble translating prosaic descriptions of an image sometimes into a visual schema because my brain wants to construct it all one way as an artist and then prosaically it moves in a completely different pattern um there are some things that, you, that can be easily quantified for example, light and shadow, you can say, oh, yeah, that's, you know, a Lambertian fall off where this point on the sphere, you know, has a relative brightness, you know, at like sine pi, one half, whatever. Um, you know, and that is not only is that the correct way to say it, that's, you know, that accurately describes what's happening at the threshold of light and shadow on that given, you know, that given hypothetical object, assuming it's a perfect sphere in this case. Um, but things like, like the force method um, or other similar methods or simplifications of anatomy, you really have to just practice it and let your brain form its own syntax because it's going to want to. Basically, part of this is universal part of this just exists as a language of forms and ideas you know especially when you're getting down to like absolutes like oh the logo's got to be you know a, 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 a green lime with you know a lightning bolt on it or whatever um, i don't know why that's my go-to but sure um <laughs> but then when you're getting to the nuances like the mood you know the, the the flow of the objects the the specifics the you know the angles the feelings the um the je ne sais quoi um the artist will find themselves in a position where they know exactly what they want to do but it gets harder and harder to describe it without launching into a whole paragraph <laughs> and that's good that's where you want to be, because that means you are processing it in a unique way. There, the lightning bolt. Um, and that is that is kind of the end goal at that point. That means that, I'm, I'm not going to say that's when you're an artist. It's not like Pinocchio where you turn into a real boy, but that's where your visual thought process is really devoted to it, really obsessing on it in the right way, in the way that you want. Um, You've probably all had the experience where you, uh, you'll you be stumped on a problem, maybe a math problem, maybe some other kind of problem, maybe some kind of life problem. You sleep on it. You, you know, maybe, maybe you have some interesting dreams that do or don't directly tie into the problem you're trying to think of. And then you wake up and you have a new insight on it. Or you go for a walk and you have a new insight on it after just, you know, staring at the, you know, the trees and the birds. The reason for this, of course is that your brain is always background processing things that it cares about. 
So you want to get obsessed about this stuff. You want to get obsessed about this stuff to the point that your brain is putting in overtime on the weekends trying to figure out the best way to render that line with the lightning bolt. <laughs> and uh, and that's okay. As I mean, as long as you remember to take breaks and try to have a stopping point where you can show the boss a draft and say, see, I am working on the line with a lightning bolt. Okay, I promise. Um, and you, you, if, you know, you've probably noticed that all of the exercise, all the little shortcuts I worked on have underpinnings that connect to the subconscious aspect. It's there, you know, because aside from what you're actually drawing, you are playing around with ideas constantly. That is inevitable. That always happens with any kind of art. You, there will always be an interplay of ideas on the canvas that transcends whatever it is that you're actually doing, even if what you're doing is trivial. You know, every time you learn something about one drawing, you're learning about other drawings that you haven't made yet, and you're also kind of mentally cross-indexing them with drawings you have made, even if those drawings aren't of the thing that you're drawing now. You know? Like... When you're working on something like, say, skin. Skin's very complicated. That's another whole other conversation because skin has multiple layers. It has subsurface scattering, transmission, reflection, blah, 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 blah. And you're looking at it. You're really thinking about the nuances of it. That will also inform the way you draw other organic substances like, you know, <laughs> um, what's a good example what's another? like wax or cheese or anything else that has the same kind of or a similar kind of subsurface scattering effect um, the way you draw hair will inform the way you draw fur because those, aren't, those two aren't quite the same um, I will briefly get into that human hair tends to um, for the most part be close in hue. I should probably be doing this in color. Um, like, if you have blonde hair, there will be some variance, especially, like, if, you know, if you're going gray or if, or if uh, you know, it gets really long. Like, it'll be, it'll seem to look darker at the roots, but it's basically the same hue. Whereas with animal hair, um, you'll get these, like, you know, you'll, what you'll see sometimes with animals is you'll see light and darker uh, guard hairs leading to like this brindle effect. Um, and uh, even though you would use different rendering methods for each of these, they still kind of inform and talk to each other in your head the more you obsess over them. <laughs> like me. Hey. Um, and again, it's, it, it's just there's like I could... This is like weeks of stuff. Years in my case. I have been at this. Let's see. I've been drawing since I was a baby. Um, I have been really seriously drawing like with an eye towards improvement for about um, 25 years, give or take. And I only feel like I've really gotten to a satisfying point probably within the last five years, maybe. So you got to put the work in. You'll know after that long, whether or not this is something you want to do as a hobby or a career or even on the weekends, because you will understand by the, at that point what role this plays in your life, your, your, you know, your work and in your brain. You know, I mean, it's, it happens almost by itself if you let it go long enough. And, um, that's kind of the joy of the experience. Um, let me see if I can probably about time to wrap this up um basically you have to find a way for a to b you know it's sort of like the start you know the starting point is always the blank canvas or sometimes the work that's passed to you with the part that you need to do and b is always the finished product but there are still so many ways to solve it. You know, there, there, there's, you know, it's not a maze where there's only one correct solution. Um, if anything, it's more like an open trail where you just, you know, the destination, but it's completely about you getting there. It's about the journey, 
the journey. This is why these cliches exist. You know, this is why people, you know, make fun of this kind of talk because it feels kind of spacey and new agey, but this is a reality in art. This is this is a reality that if you if you get deep into the stuff, you will connect with and confront the stuff. And it really it tells more than anything else, you can learn more about yourself when working hard on a piece than about the technique or the piece that you're working on. <laughs> Um, but for me, that's probably the best part. That is probably the part that has been the most fascinating and insightful. The real shortcuts were the friends we made along the way. <laughs> All right. Well, um, last chance. Any, uh, any questions, anything, any more Q and A? I was going to talk about mind maps, but I think we pretty much covered all the critical brainstorming stuff. Oh, you know, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. You really don't have to have a formal education with stuff. Having a formal education in art confers both certain advantages and disadvantages. This is important because I, I hear a lot of people like fretting about, art. oh, I can't afford art school. You're right. Art school is expensive. Art school is expensive and it's not necessarily... The good ones don't necessarily guarantee you opportunities or learning. What what happens with art school? What, you know, the best teachers I had were the ones who were kind of like willing to really get down, you know, abandon principle and, you know, um, dogma and just get really down to the technique and really teach us stuff and critique us. I had one, um, one it was representational art. That was the name of the class. And... She just, we would do everything in charcoal, which I hate. I hate charcoal so much. And then she would just get everyone to do a, you know, we would put everything up on the board after an hour and just really get deep into analysis and critique. And it was just, I, I reached this point where I would just, I would just march in there with an espresso and be like, let's go, let's go, bring it on. You know, because it was so meaty. It was so, um, it was so insightful. Um, I never stopped hating charcoal. But, <laughs> but that's where the, the good one, is, good ones are, and you can find those online. It doesn't have to be a formal. It doesn't have to be an, an art academy. It doesn't have to be. The, you know, the benefit of academies is, you know, better Q and A, better feedback. You know, more networking, uh, peers that you can talk to, and you know, it it, it does confer advantages. It, it also it's also gonna you know, put you in the kind of debt that, like, you get with medical school. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, there are scores, legions of online resources now. Um, so many great sites for every phase of the, of the art process. So many. Um, one thing I didn't get a chance to talk to is that Clip Studio Paint has an asset store. Um which is just, it's just this little shopping, you know, shopping center full of just things you can download and use, like fancy brushes, you know, patterns, um, action sets, uh, all kinds of crap, you know, rubber stamp stuff like clouds, um, which can be a huge time saver. So you got all that, you've got, you know, you've got sites with, sites and apps with, mannequins models there's sketchfab which is this wealth of 3d stuff that you can that was another thing i didn't have time to really get into you can you can download 3d objects into uh csp and position them um you know it, it if if you want to get good at this stuff just explore it all just get on out there and try stuff make mistakes and do it all with the aim of not necessarily not necessarily impressing anyone it's, I mean, it's not bad to impress people, but like not necessarily impressing anyone um, or even learning, but just playing, just just understanding both the landscape of what you're doing and the landscape of, of like how you feel about it, how your mind reacts to it. And when you really get that down, when you really master it, um, it's it's an amazing experience. It really is. 
and uh, I tremendously enjoyed having uh, a little time to impart all this to you. I hope it's been real uh, insightful for everyone. Um, I really want to do this more, so um, let me uh, let me drop my Twitter in the chat so you can watch me. There you go. Um, yeah, I uh, I, tr I stream on Twitch every once in a while, most of it's you know, game streams, stuff like that. Um, I uh, I'm working on things like a Patreon and a Discord and so on and so forth. You know, if you want to, uh, you know, if, if that's something that uh, you wanna you wanna help like support me. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you, Cozy Khan. Thanks uh, especially to Tamarin and Vanilla Skunk for major technical help thank you so much um and all the mods for being awesome and the audience for just uh letting me meander <laughs> for two hours um i really appreciate this i am gonna probably apply for another panel for i think what is it september is the next one so you know maybe look out for that and um yeah i think that's about it <laughs> all right y'all um okay september yeah great yeah that's great um yeah no this has been this has been a blast a little nerve-wracking <laughs> a lot of fun <laughs> all right um i think that's me